All I'm thinking about is what's going on in the story, what's going to happen next, what would be really cool if this happened, right? That, that kind of thing. And I'm not worried about really anything else. And that's, that's really, really empowering. Um, and so it really kind of firms up the, that GM role, too. And so it makes, makes the players and the, 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 those roles that are on the table, it makes them more distinct from each other, whereas other games are experimenting with making them more similar. Uh, I think they're both valid. And wow, that was long Monday. <laughs> so I will stop talking about that now. Something that I obviously feel strong about. Uh, what else do you guys want to talk about? Yeah. All right, so you said it's a very exciting time to be a role player, and I agree. And I, I think you're aware that a lot of us are leaving the table and going before the PC and using applications like Google Plus or uh, uh, other, I call it Jetson's television tower. You know. And uh, people like Gentleman Gamer are going out and hosting games. Um, and as, have you as a game designer considered that, that the game is moving away from the table and maybe going to the PC to some degree? Uh, very, very much so. Um, I run a lot of my games uh, using G+. Um, you know, Numenera is uh, the result of a Kickstarter campaign that we did. Uh, and if any of you were Kickstarter backers, thank you. Um, and uh, we, um, uh, as, for example, as one of the reward levels, one of them was, uh, you know, I'll run a game for you. And those games will be handled via G+, for example. Oh, cool. We did a lot of playtesting with G+. Um, Very cool. We're looking into uh, working with some of the people out there who are creating interesting uh, sort of add-ons to make those kinds of online virtual game sessions easier, things like Roll20 and, and things like that. Um, I, I definitely think, I mean, I will always be a, a purist. I will always think that the best way to play a role-playing mm -hmm. game is sitting around a table with your friends, eating junk food, and <laughs> telling Monty Python jokes. But um, you know, I, I, I realize, you know, I think like all of us that that that's getting harder and harder to do. With schedules matching up, and sometimes your friends move away, and uh, you know, you want to keep gaming with them. So I think that things like G Plus. And Skype and, you know, all the other things that are out there uh, are definitely something that, I guess, a game designer you have to think about now. I think it, it even actually works in the game mechanics, right? Because the thing we were talking about earlier, where you go and get a sandwich while you're waiting for the next 20 players to figure out their, all of their moves, like, with, with Numenera, you can't do that. And I think that when we played on G+, what we found, there's a bigger disconnect, right? Because you're not actually around the table. You're on the computer, and so there's already a bit of distance. And there's a million other things like flashing on your computer and requesting attention. And so the fact that you actually have to pay attention, that you roll all the die, that at any moment you can have a team intrusion, I think actually works really well for those those interactive games. Um, and I find that like I can't sort of start zoning out the way that I can with other games on because I actually have to pay attention. <laughs> otherwise, all of a sudden it's like, um, what are you doing about that game intrusion? I'm going, what? So I think that the, the game mechanics of being quicker and having to pay attention help uh, decrease some of that distance. Excellent. Yeah, I agree. I don't see a lot of people, you know, on their on their smartphones checking their Twitter when I'm, when I'm running a game of New Era as opposed to um, something like Indie or something where there is sort of more because there's just more downtime, right? There's more mm -hmm. temptation to to have your attention drawn right. by something else going on. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, uh, 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 slightly, slightly off the topic. Um, how do you feel as, I mean, because this is obviously your baby, um, you know, this is the culmination of all your years of experience and everything like that, and Kickstarter was very successful. Um, how do you feel about quarantine and piracy and people, you know, stealing your stuff online? Um, like, <laughs> <laughs> it looks hard. No, I mean, uh, I, 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 I don't, I, I don't like it. it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, um, you know, there are, uh, there's this idea that. You know, oh, you know that some big company, you know, oh, Wizards of the Coast, I'll, I'll, I'll pirate this latest D and D product because they're some big company and they're owned by Hasbro, which is a bigger company, right? And 
you know, uh, Monte Good Games is, is Shauna and I and a couple of other people. And so, you know, when, if, if people are, are pirating our stuff, it's, it's you know, literally a, a, a significant amount of money that isn't, isn't going to us, right? Not to some big faceless company, but to us, the creators, right? And I'm, I'm a big proponent of supporting, directly supporting creators. That's why I like Kickstarter. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I'm also, I'm also of the opinion that I think that most people, if you don't kind of force them to become pirates, right, they won't, right? So if you make something that is easily obtained legally and is, is not, you know, exorbitantly expensive, right, isn't crippled with tons of protections and things like that, that so it's easy to use, then most people will support you. And so I, I mean, it's a problem, but I don't think it's a gigantic problem. Well, how do you feel, um, because I assume when you were getting ready to release and you were contemplating how you were going to do things, this, that, and the other thing, um, like Fate, for instance, um, it can start to such a huge level that they wound up having basically a pay what you want um, for a Fate core, uh, where on the flip side of that, um, Fantasy Flight with their Star Wars stuff, whatnot, and with their uh, their, their Warhammer Fantasy stuff, um, made it that you there are physical things in this kit, you know, special dice and this that and the other thing to keep people from being able to successfully pirate. Because you, even if you get the book, you don't have the things you can actually run it. I mean, did you contemplate either of those spectrums when you were doing this? Uh, not seriously. Um, uh, I, I sort of have a problem with both ends of those spectrums. Um, I think uh, certainly was the our, our choice to go sort of more in the middle. Um, uh, you know, I have I have talked to the guys at Fate uh, and uh, you know who, who, uh, who have done Fate. And, uh, I'm not convinced that the pay what you want model is is a particularly Great model. Um, I think it goes too far. Uh, On the other hand, you know, I've got a copy of the new Star Wars game, but I still don't have the dice, so I can't actually play. And that seems silly to me. Um, so, you know, I think somewhere in the middle. Um, you know, yeah. I mean, I think the, the trouble with pay what you think it's worth programs is that most people don't understand what something is worth. Right, so we're saying, hey, what you think is worth, but I mean, we've noticed this with, with our Glimmer ebook line, which we're putting out to be really, really affordable, um, and it's allowing us a lot of flexibility. And you know, people don't understand that we're still paying artists. Uh, you know, we pay all of our artists a really good wage. We think they're important. We pay our writers a good wage. We pay our editors a good wage. Um, we don't pay Monty anything, but that's okay. <laughs> um, and so, you know, when they look at an ebook, they don't see that we have paid the artist and the layout person and the editor, right? And so they think, oh, it's only six pages of something. It's not worth anything. Um, and so it's a weird thing of, of expecting fans to do a lot of research into how much things cost and what they're actually worth. And so that gets really tricky. On the other hand, I want to trust our fans in, you know, completely, absolutely, without, you know. And so we just created this, what we think is a really lenient fan use policy so that fans can create their own content. Um, and we, you know, we really tried to allow them to use images, um, you know, with proper credit. And so we really want to create a fan base that trust, that we can trust and can trust us back. And, and that's what you right. We trust that they won't steal. They trust that we'll give them something worth their money. And so for me, that's, that's the kind of system that I want to create, is where I see there's trust and worth on both sides. I was really happy to see $20 player guide, everything that I need to make a character, mm -hmm. and not have to invest in the level of getting the big book to run a game. Was the decision to do that also partially influenced by just the economics of yes. this? Yes. I, I mean, I think, just from a responsibility level, right, that if you're going to create a big, huge, thick book, it's going to cost a lot of money, um, and 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 um, you know, but to sort of require because because you know going back to like what we were saying at the beginning, right? This is a group activity. You require 
everyone around the table to plunk down that amount of money um, just seems wrong to me. Um, so, you know, pretty much, uh, again, it's just, just as a general philosophy, while I love big, beautiful books and big, thick tomes and, and you know, chock full of all kinds of amazing stuff, um, I think any time that I would do something like that now, uh, you know, I, I, I did a, for example, I did a, a big setting book for, for D20 called Talks. And we did a 32 page player's guide. Right? The idea that, you know, not everybody needs to know all of this stuff. I mean, somebody around the table needs a book, but, but not all of them, right? So to create a, a, a much smaller, more affordable player's guide, I, I, I think that's a model that I'll always want to use. Um, and it seems to, it, it seems to be a popular option. It seems to be something that people And plus, you know, it just, it works well for the role-playing game market, right? Because some game masters aren't going to want players to be able to have access to everything that's in the game. And so the player's guide just gives you everything you need. Um, well, so it's an interesting time because um, you, know, you can you can make the argument that um, the number one role playing game in the world is D and D, and the number two role playing game in the world is D and D. One of those is called Pathfinder. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, that's, um, and in fact, here's the really weird thing. If you look at, um, player polls, you look at sales figures, um, even, even from a sales point of view, third edition D&D and 3.5 are still viable that is still a viable game line right alongside 4th edition D&D. And so it might very well be that the top three role players <laughs> being sold today are D&D. &D. Um, and then you, you, know, you start throwing in you know, old school renaissance stuff, which is all basically D&D. &D. And, and the fact that Wizards of the Coast is putting out um, you know, new versions of all of the prior editions of D&D. There's a lot of D&D out there. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, you know, it's like we were saying before, right? There's all these exciting, innovative things that are kind of going in a completely different direction. Um, and, you know, like, I mean, I, I, I made a, a joke about Star Wars, but, you know, the new there's a new Star Wars game that looks really cool. There's a new Shadowrun game coming out. 13th Age, which is sort of D&D. Yeah, <laughs> sort of D&D again. Um, you know, there's... It's, it's a very interesting time. There's a lot of new role-playing games. There's a lot of new role-playing games coming up next year, too. Um, and some of those look really cool. Uh, you know, it, it's a great time because a, a couple of years ago, people were saying, you know, role-playing is, is dying. Role-playing is going to be dead. But, you know, here's the thing. I started professionally uh, in 1980, working in the industry in 1988. And at that time, someone told me, um, you know, well, enjoy this while it lasts, because in five years, you won't be doing this anymore. Right? We, computer games will completely wipe out traditional <laughs> games. That was in 88. And basically, every, every year since then, someone has told me some variation on, well, role-playing games are only going to be around for another five years or so. Tops. Um, and so... I don't know. I think it's, it's an interesting time to ask that question, too, because right five years ago, there were only so many role-playing games because there were only so many companies producing them, right? And Hello Kickstarter, right, which has changed the role-playing industry completely, 
And so now there are the, the number of game companies, even the even the you know, because they're small, right? But the number of game companies and the number of game options is so much broader than it was, you know, even five years ago. Then I think what we're gonna start seeing is is it a real change in even that question, right? Of what are the top role playing games? Well, it's gonna be more like, well, what are the top rules of the games? What are the top, you know, games like Fiasco, whatever? And so it's gonna it'll be interesting to see how that falls out because it's also moving, like it's changing so rapidly. The fact that you have, I'll call it first generation PD players like myself, that although I don't have kids, a lot of had kids couldn't play and now find themselves, oh wait, our kids are in college. <laughs> you know, I mean, you think that that might have a lot to do with, like you're saying, you're seeing that a lot of the young ones have been playing with their 11 year old who mentioned earlier. I do see that as a big factor, and in fact, that's one of the things that we credit with the huge success of 3rd Edition back in 2000, was that, um, that people had, we had the, the gamers, the, the gaming community had matured to the point where now, not only did they have kids, but they had kids that were starting to come of age, that, you know, you had, you know, arguably D&D's biggest heyday before that in the very early 1980s, right? And I remember growing up and being in junior high and high school and basically every, certainly every boy in my class had probably tried D&D or was thinking, you know, had new guys who played, you know, it was, it was, it was sort of that ubiquitous. It was, you know, back in the early 80s. And, you know, you kind of just do the math and you get to about 2000, you know, and into, you know, into the middle 2000s and, you know, yeah, all of those people are going to now have kids who are now getting to be about the age that they were when they first started playing D&D. And, you know, people are looking for things to do with their kids and they're like, well, what did I do when I'm, oh, that's right, doesn't it? <laughs> that's right. And um, so I, I think that there's a lot of that and I think that that's still going. Um, so, I think we're going to see role playing games do this weird, interesting generational thing. You know, they, they pass down from my father's kind of thing. Um, and, uh, yeah. Um, but I, I, it's, it is clearly, um, it is clearly a, a factor. You know, I rarely hear now about kids starting role-playing games just kind of on their own. But I hear all the time about kids starting to play role-playing games with their parents. Or their, or their friends' parents. Right. Like we hear parents say, my kids and their two friends came over and play, right? right. Which, Which like, yes. you know, in my generation, that wasn't the case. Right? In my generation, it was the kids who were playing and the parents who thought, what is it that they're doing down there? Um, but, you know, I, it's actually probably a little more refreshing this way with, with families. Back then it was still you know, shrouded in secrecy. And still had the, 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 the scourge of you know the, the hammer of the church behind you. you know, it was definitely priests watching through the window when you were playing D&D in the basement. You know, that, that, absolutely. And that's just, I don't hear those stories anymore. If that's a factor, it's so small, you know, it's not a it, 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 it very, very rarely is a factor. Um, you even had that scourge for a while, and now it's pretty much gone. Well, you know, it... The, yeah, it's it, the the target just keeps changing. It was Harry Potter for a while, and uh, yeah, you know, um, they just don't like magic. Yeah. I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to the book signing part. Okay. Uh, before we do that, um, everyone that's here, I'm giving everyone should have a little red ticket. Yep. Uh, 